This month our preaching will coincide with our one house reading. How many are still on track with your one house reading? You're doing your best to read through the Bible together. This is what I've challenged you to do, challenged us to do. We're reading through the Bible together this entire year. We did it last year, and it went very, very well. And we kind of learned a little bit how to do that, I think. And so um, I've called this church to do it again. Um, So thank you for those who are on track. No guilt or condemnation to anyone who's not on track. Um, you get a you get a free uh, start again tomorrow or today. So don't think that well I'm so far behind that I can't catch up. Don't worry about catching up then. Some of you could catch up then you do that. But my goal is that we read the Word of God every day, and I know that we can do this. We're all busy. How many are busy? Six people are busy. I don't believe it. You all aren't wanting to respond to me today. It's all right. We're all busy. But I believe that the word of God is important enough for us to make it a priority. Amen? So there are some reading guides in the foyer. Um, Just avail yourself to that. It keeps you right on track. Or you can go to YouVersion. Here's, here's what I recommend. If you don't have YouVersion on your phone, you need that, first of all. There's like 1,600 versions of, you know, there's so many options for you. If the message is what you like, then you can read through the message version. And some just went like that, you know. They'll never read the message Bible. Well, if King James is your thing, then you can read it in King James. But you don't even have to read it on the YouVersion uh, app of the Bible. You can just press play, and it will read it for you. And I think it's amazing. So jump in with us. If you're new to La Palma Christian Center, join us. Um, This week, our reading took us to Luke chapter 2. So get your Bible, and let's go to Luke chapter 2. Come on, let's all go into the Word of God together today. Luke chapter 10, I said 2, didn't I? Luke chapter 10, now I'm confusing myself. Look at verse number 25. It says, and behold, a lawyer stood up to put Jesus to the test. Not a good idea. A lawyer stood up to put Jesus to the test and said, teacher, what shall I do to inherit Eternal life, not a bad question to ask, but he had the wrong motive, wrong intention. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to this lawyer, what is written in the law? You notice what Jesus did right there. He answered the lawyer's question with a question. What do you see the law teaching. What do you see the law saying? He asked the lawyer, how do you read it? And the lawyer answered, well, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And you should love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus replies back to the lawyer, you have answered correctly. So just do this. And you will live. You will have eternal life. Basically, Jesus is telling this lawyer, it's simple. The Father has made this simple for us. Just do this and you will live forever. But he, desiring to justify himself, says to Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? Wow. Who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, let me tell you a little story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and departed 
leaving him half dead or leaving him for dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that same road. And when he saw the wounded traveler, he passed by on the other side. Somebody say the other side. Uh huh. He passed by on the other side. Not willing to stop, not willing to help, too busy to get involved, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite comes by. And when he came to the place where the wounded traveler was, he saw him and he also passed by on the other side. Say it one more time. The other side. But a Samaritan, of all things, of all the people, a Samaritan, as he journeyed, he came to where the wounded traveler was. And when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. So he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own donkey and brought him to an inn to take care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Then Jesus asked the lawyer, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And the lawyer answered, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for your presence in this room. Thank you for prodding us and prompting us. Lord, we quiet ourselves now to hear your, your word. We pray you speak to us. And show us how we can better love our neighbors. We pray it in Jesus' name. About four years ago, I received a call from one of my neighbors. She was crying, and she told me that her husband's time to pass was fast approaching. We had known that her husband was going to pass soon, but you never know the actual day. You never know the actual time. So I immediately went to my neighbor's house and when they opened the door and I stepped through the doorway, her husband passed just as I entered the house. Those neighbors were Ken and Joe Studebaker. I don't see Joe here. Joe, you here? I hope you're watching then. I sure do love you. We've been watching for Ken, knowing his time was coming. They're my actual neighbors. They're my closest neighbor in proximity. We can talk over the wall. Marlene sometimes does. <laughs> hey, Joe. Get her a good little stepladder. Because see, she's so short, you know, she's got to have that stepladder to look over the wall. But every now and then she'll talk to Joe. My actual neighbors. I wanted to do everything possible to love my neighbor. But I have other neighbors. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know all of my neighbors' names. 
How many are with me? You got some neighbors that you know, and then you got some neighbors you don't really know. And I'll go a step further in my confession to you and to God. I could use a little help in loving my neighbors. Anybody with me today? And I'm not just talking about down Pine Ridge and off of Walker. Because our neighbors, may we not be confused as this conniving lawyer was as to who our neighbors are. Our neighbors are those around us that are in need. Our neighbors are those around us who are hurting and in trouble. How many need some help in loving your neighbors? That's what I want to talk about today. Loving our neighbors. Jesus had just finished a debrief with 70 disciples that he had sent out with special power and special authority to do the things that he had done. The 70 return, and I can just imagine them swapping stories. One says, dude, I laid my hands on this blind guy and his eyes opened up. (laughs) Can you imagine praying for somebody that's Legally blind, physically blind, actually blind, and in Jesus' name, their eyes open and they're able to see. Can anybody even imagine that? And how would you tell about that? And would you ever stop telling that? I'll never forget, you will say, that day when I felt prompted to pray for this blind guy. And as I did... The power of God came upon me and the power of God came through me and Jesus healed a blind man. Another of the 70 pipes up and he says, yeah, yeah, yeah. I prayed for for a woman who had leprosy and the leprosy immediately disappeared. It vanished from her. Another one pipes up and says, yeah, even demons were subject to us in your name. Coming back totally amazed and in awe at what happened through their lives to neighbors that they didn't even know their names. To neighbors that before that encounter they had never even met. Neighbors that weren't even in the same city that they lived in. They were dispatched throughout the area. Different towns, different villages. In fact, Jesus told them, listen, if you come to some village or some town and they won't have anything to do with you, what were they supposed to do? Just dust off your shoes and dust off your pants and dust off your robe and move on. Don't even look back. Because there's somebody else that's going to receive what I'm sending you out to give. Don't be discouraged when somebody turns you down when you say, why don't you come to church with me? (coughs) Because somebody else is going to say yes. Right, Ken? Right, buddy? You got one of your best friends sitting with you. It's like your third week. You keep coming around, we're going to think you're part of our family. And I hope it is so. I imagine the one saying, yeah, even demons. This blew my mind. Even demons were subject to us in your name. We're casting demons out. We're telling demons where to go. And they obeyed. To which Jesus replied, I love this. Jesus said, yeah, I was there when God kicked Satan out of heaven and he fell like lightning. (laughs) If you've got your Bible open, you can just look back a few verses and see that. It's so amazing. So there's this debrief happening. Seventy disciples with special authority, special power sent out by Jesus. 
And then, as they are debriefing, they are rudely interrupted by some expert in the law. And he stood up to challenge Jesus with a wrong heart and a wrong mind and a wrong motive. What must I do to inherit eternal life? As I said earlier, not a bad question if it's asked with purity and honesty. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus answers his question with a question which was a common response from a rabbi. What does the law say? How do you read that? Love God, love my neighbors, the lawyer responds. You've answered correctly. Just do that then. Don't complicate it. Just do that. Love God and love your neighbor like you love yourself. And don't we love ourselves? Anybody look in a mirror today? Anybody look in a mirror more than once today? I had to make sure the part in my hair was right, Frank. Come on, buddy. Come on, Pastor Peter. But that's not good enough for the, for the lawyer, the deceptive lawyer. But who is my neighbor, he asked. Who is my neighbor? Who are my neighbors? So Jesus quiets everybody. Let me tell you a little story. He goes on to teach those listening by telling them the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus replied, verse number 30, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him, beat him, then left and left him for half dead. So what do we know about the traveler? A few things. First of all, he was reckless and foolish. This traveler, he was traveling a notoriously dangerous road. The road from Jerusalem to Jericho was about 17 miles and drops down about 3,600 feet from start to finish. It was a narrow and rocky road with lots of places to hide, which made it the perfect place, the happy hunting ground for thieves and bandits. It was so bad, it had the nickname of the Bloody Way. There was so much robbery and thievery, bandits everywhere. People would almost always travel this road with others to avoid being ambushed and to avoid being robbed. To travel this road alone was reckless and foolish. And this man traveled alone. What happens? Well, he's ambushed, he's robbed, he's beaten, and he's left for dead. Stripped of his clothes, laying there naked, unconscious. They don't know if he's alive or dead. It looks and appears as though he is dead, which is part of the problem we have with some of those coming by, like the priest. A priest comes by, the Bible says. Now, the priest may have been thinking that if he touched a dead man, he would be unclean for seven days. That's what Numbers chapter 19 and verse number 11 teaches. Touching this man could mean he would lose his turn of duty in the temple. But notice what the Bible says. This priest was coming from Jerusalem, traveling to Jericho. He was coming down the road, which means that his turn at the temple duties was already done. So this shouldn't have mattered. But the priest let his love for religious duties trump his care for those in need. I wonder how many times we've missed the mark. How many times has the Holy Spirit tried to direct our steps to the hurting and to the needy, but we're too busy? Don't get quiet on me now. 
or we just don't want to get involved. We don't want to get our hands dirty. We don't want to get entangled in somebody's life that is a mess. But can I remind you that that's where you were not very long ago, perhaps not many months ago, not many years ago, but somebody decided to pause, somebody decided to stop, somebody decided that you were worth getting involved in, you were worth adjusting their schedule, you were worth getting their hands dirty, you were worth entangling their life to your life. Can I just remind you of that? You see, God, in His love for us, has sent somebody to each and every one of us. You just didn't happen to come to the Lord. God orchestrated your steps. And God ordered your steps. And He put people in your path. He put people in your way. God wanted to use this priest a priest, a religious leader. But the priest missed it. Next comes a Levite. A Levite comes by. Now the rules for the Levites weren't quite as strict as those for the priest, but there were still rules to follow. And this Levite also wanted to avoid being defiled. Also, the robbers would oftentimes use decoys. For instance, one of the robbers would act as the wounded man. And when some unexpecting, kind-hearted traveler stopped to help him, the other bandits would rush in and overpower him, strip him, rob him, beat him, and leave him for dead. And there was a motto among the Levites that they live by. Here it is. Better safe than sorry. Better safe than sorry. I think I'll just go to the other side. Come on, somebody say the other side. I'm just going to turn a blind eye. I'm going to pretend like I didn't see that. And we try to convince ourselves and we try to even convince God. When we know deep down inside, I was supposed to help that person. I was supposed to love my neighbor. Then a Samaritan comes by. The listeners may have thought, aha! Here comes the villain. Elbow and watch what he says about these no good Samaritans. You see, the Israelites and the Samaritans had no dealings with each other and really no love for each other. But Jesus shocks the listeners by making the Samaritan the hero instead of the villain. And it is the Samaritan who helps us see what is required in loving our neighbors today. What is required? Well, loving our neighbors requires compassion. I don't have a lot of notes for you, but I really feel the Lord is speaking to us today. Hear the word of the Lord. Loving our neighbors requires compassion. Back to verse 33. But a Samaritan of all people, as he journeyed this road, he came to where the wounded traveler was, and when he saw him, look what happened. He had compassion. He was moved with compassion. One of the most important ingredients in effectively loving our neighbors is compassion. What do I mean by compassion? What is compassion? It is sympathetic pity and concern for the suffering or misfortunes of others. Let me say that again. Compassion. Sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings 
or misfortunes of other people. Something touches your heart. Something pricks your heart and moves you a little bit from center. Compassion. We see a need and we are compelled by compassion. See, compassion is to compel us. We see it And so we have to do something about it. We refuse to sit idly by and do nothing. Why? Because of compassion. We have to get our hands dirty. We have to get involved. We have to say, listen, I'm going to have to move my schedule around. I've got to call somebody because I had a meeting, but I can't even do that meeting because... The Holy Spirit has guided me and directed to me, directed me to someone in need, someone who's hurting, someone who's suffering. And I've been moved with compassion. Don't just let yourself be moved in your heart. That's just the starting place for compassion. Jesus had compassion, and so should we. The Bible says that when he saw the crowds, Matthew 9, 36, he had compassion for them because they were harassed, they were helpless, they were hurting, they were wounded, and they were lost. They were like sheep without a shepherd. I've got to do something. It starts in the heart, but it morphs. It moves. And now what's going on? Now it's in my feet. Mm, Wait a minute, what's, what's happening? Now it's in my hands. Compassion compels us. What is going on, God? You know I don't have very much of this. You put your hand down, Pastor Peter. Come on, somebody. Don't leave compassion just in your heart. Don't let it just go to your head. It's supposed to go to your feet. Mm. Compassion compels me. I can't stay where I am. Compassion compels me. I can't sit by and do nothing. I've got to get involved in this situation. I've got to get involved with this person. I've got to get involved in their life. How are you doing At loving your neighbor. We've got to have compassion. Yes, in our heart. Yes, in our mind. But God help us that we are compelled by compassion to move our feet. and To get our hands involved. It's what's required. God give me compassion. Come on, somebody. Pray it with me right where you are. God, give me compassion. Anybody need a little bit more compassion? Yeah. It's coming. But I got to warn you. When it comes, you're going to have to do something. Hurting people, suffering people, they're everywhere. I'm telling you, they're everywhere. God, move us with compassion. What else is required? Loving our neighbors. Number two, it requires sacrifice. Don't skip. Don't skip this requirement. Because of compassion, not only in our heart, but in our feet, And in our hands, sacrifice is required. Look at verses 34 and 35 of our text today. So the Samaritan went to the wounded traveler. He bound him up, bound up his wounds, gave him medicine, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal, his own donkey. 
and led him, pulling the donkey, leading the donkey, with the wounded man on the donkey, gave up his seat, took him to an inn, and took care of him. Sometimes we don't really lean into this part of it. And we think, oh, he took him to the inn so the innkeeper could take care of him. Well, the innkeeper definitely had a part to play, and he did take care of him, but who took care of him first? The Samaritan himself. He sacrificed and took care of the wounded man. And then the next day, so he actually stayed with this wounded man overnight to take care of him. The next day, he took out some money. Come on and get your wallet out, everybody. Seriously. Get your purse, ladies. Get in your wallet, men. I want to see it. I want to see it. Butler's holding up her phone with Bank of America. You know my Venmo, right? You already know that. Let me see what, what you got. You might say there's not much in there. Doesn't matter. There's something in there. I want to see it. Do you know how blessed you are? Do you know how blessed you are? I'm talking about on your worst day. I haven't said this for a, a little while. I used to say this often, but it's still so true. On my worst day, I'm far more blessed. On the day that I struggle the most financially, I'm far more blessed than the vast majority of the world. We need to keep that in perspective. Why has God blessed me? Why has God blessed you? I believe that we are blessed to be a blessing. And perhaps I've said it so much that it falls on deaf ears. But when I say to you, be blessed and be a blessing, that's what I mean and that's what God means. God longs to bless us. God loves to bless us. And if we will stay in a position of being blessed and then letting God use us to bless others, His blessings will never stop. He will continue to pour out His blessings upon us so we can pause on the path and we can take time to help someone in need and I'm telling you again they're all around us the hurting and the suffering and the helpless use your blessing to help somebody and in doing so you'll love your neighbor like you've never loved your neighbor before the next day this Samaritan took out his money his hard earned money and gave it to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I come back, so there's at least three days involvement. There's the day of, there's the next day, and then the Samaritan says, I'm going to come back and check on him. And if you've spent more than I've given you to take care of him, I'm going to repay you. He didn't even know this man. He didn't know his name. He didn't know where he lived. He didn't know where he was going. But none of that mattered. Because why? He was moved with compassion. Which is a requirement. If you want to help your neighbor. If you want to love your neighbor. Only the Samaritan sacrificially helped the wounded man. Look what he sacrificed. He sacrificed his resources. Apparently, he had bandages on him. Or perhaps he had extra clothing that he ripped up to bandage this man. We don't really know. But the Bible says clearly he bound up his wounds. He, he had bandages or he made bandages. This guy's bleeding and if I don't help him, he might bleed out. He was left for dead. He was left half dead, I think it says. The Samaritan's the only one who took the time to find out if the guy was actually alive or dead. And once he realized that he was alive, he said, I've got to do something. So let me sacrifice the bandages I have or let me just make bandages and I'll rip off the bottom of my robe and I'll tie off so you don't bleed to death, first of all. 
Think about it. What are you willing to give that is yours, that God has blessed you with, that you've earned with your, hard, your own hard-earned money, you bought it? What are you willing to give away? What are you willing to sacrifice? Started with bandages, and then he's, he goes through more of, of his belongings. He's like, oh, here's some, here's some oil, here's some wine. Let me just, let me just pour some wine over it, some, some alcohol perhaps. This is a Samaritan. It doesn't say anything about him knowing Jesus or following Jesus. He just said, I, I could use this. Let me sanitize the wound. Here's some oil, probably medicinal. Let me give this. He's sacrificing what he has. That's for him and maybe for his family. And then is the matter of his own donkey, which he was riding. There's no way you're going to get the wounded man and this man on a donkey. So he says, I'm going to put you on the donkey and I'll just, I'll lead the donkey to where we're going. How far was he on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho? Those details we don't have. They could have been very close or they could have been very far. No matter. He pulls this donkey by the reins, making sure the wounded man doesn't fall off possibly having to stop from time to time and readjust and just pulling this donkey with this wounded man. I know just where I'll go. I'll go to so-and-so's inn. He probably knew the innkeeper. I'll go there because I know he's going to help me. I know he's going to take care of him as well. What else did he sacrifice? He sacrificed his resources. He sacrificed his time. How many know time is a valuable commodity? And we're all busy. This man sacrificed his time. He stopped what he was doing and where he was going to help the wounded man. Clock ticking. He took the time to help that man that day. By taking him to this inn, he cared for him once he got to the inn that day. Spent the night checking on him in the morning. And then he came back later. That's a lot of time. Can I just tell you something today, church? Loving your neighbors takes time. And there's some that will require more time than other people. Don't look around the room. Just look at me. Because I'm one of them. I take a lot of time. You see what I'm saying? I'm an effort for people, some people. You might be saying, oh, pastor, you're so easy to love. God bless you. I'm not that easy to love for some people. And neither are you. I mean, that's, that's just the gospel truth. All of us are an effort to somebody. <laughs> if you're writing notes, just say, I'm a lot of work. I'm a lot of effort sometimes. Thank you, Frank. I'm raising my hand too. Come on. How many would admit that sometimes you're just a lot? You're a lot. Come on, turn to your neighbor, tell him you're a lot. I love you. I love you. This man invested the resource, one of the most valuable things that we have. He, he invested his time. What else? Well, we already pulled out our wallets and our, our purses and what little we have. Well, some of us have a lot, actually. His money. His hard-earned money. You might say, two denarii, what, what's that? It's money is what it is. And he just so freely and so willingly gave it. He paid for this guy's hotel and he had a room himself. He spent the night. There's two rooms. 
Anybody know what hotels go for today? A lot more than last year. A lot more than five years ago. So, somebody say cha-ching, right? We're just adding all this up. Cha-ching. Two rooms overnight. Well, the dude had to have some food. There we go. Let me, let me buy you a meal and I'm hungry myself. So it adds up. It adds up. Then he had to take, take care of this man. It says that he took him to the inn and he took care of him. Right here. He took him to an inn and then he took care of him. He made do with what he had in his duffel bag. His saddle bag on the donkey. What do I have in here? I'm not prepared for, to take care of a man that's so badly wounded. He's going to bleed to death perhaps. Don't even know if he's alive or dead. And I found out he is alive, but I, I've got limited supplies. So he's got to invest in, in taking care of this guy. Come on. Cha-ching. Can you just see me with the visor and the cigarette sticking out of my mouth and I'm doing the atom machine? I don't smoke. I'm just saying, we're adding this all up. That's a lot of money, I suppose. No matter where it is, it's all relative. But think of, think of uh, two rooms. Think of uh, some food. Think of some medicine, some supplies. And then he just kept going. He gave the innkeeper money and he promised that if there is additional monies that are spent, I'll pay you back. I'll, I'll reimburse you. That just amazes me. He even paid for additional cost for the care of a wounded man that we don't even get his name. The Samaritan man didn't even know the wounded man, but compassion caused him to sacrifice his resources, his time, even his money in order to help a man in need. One more requirement for loving our neighbors. Loving our neighbors requires mercy. Let me close this message. Back to our text, verses 36 and 37. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? The lawyer says, well, obviously, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus says to the lawyer, go and do likewise. The one who showed mercy. What a beautiful word, by the way. Mercy. Mercy. Do you know another word for mercy is simply kindness? Kindness. Being kind to others. Being kind to someone, no matter their age, their ethnicity, their financial status. No matter the past. Someone might say, but pastor, some people are hard to be kind to. Which is the, the, exact, the exact same thing that somebody's thinking about you. To be fair, showing kindness and being merciful may be difficult at times or with certain people. But do you know who helps us with this? Anybody know where I'm going? The fruit of the Holy Spirit. Which is kindness. We'll just skip all that other. The fruit of the Spirit is kindness. Mercy. Today we're talking about loving our neighbors. One commentator, as I prepared this message, one commentator wrote to the lawyer, 
the wounded man was a subject to discuss. To the thieves, the wounded man was someone to use and exploit. To the religious men, the priest and the Levite, the wounded man was a problem to be avoided. To the innkeeper, the wounded man was a customer to serve for a fee. To the Samaritan, the wounded man was a human being worth being cared for and loved. And to Jesus, all of them and all of us are worth dying for. Would you stand with me today, please? With heads bowed and eyes closed. If you're here today and you're not in, you're not in right relationship with God and you need to ask Him to come in and forgive you of sins and you need to recommit your yourself to him if you're here and you would like to rededicate your life to Christ I just want you to raise your hand is there anyone here you need to rededicate your life perhaps you're here and you've never dedicated your life you could raise your hand Lord here we are in your house we read this, this story, this parable of how you explain to this lawyer who was trying to trick, trick Jesus. He lays out this beautiful example of loving our neighbors. And we confess today that we don't always get this right and we confess that we actually need some help in doing this better. So Lord, would you give us the requirements that are needed? Give us compassion. Help us to sacrifice. Give us mercy. So that we can be even more effective in what we've been called to do. Loving our neighbors. Let's say together, Amen. Amen. Live stream family, sure wish you were in this room with us. But we understand that many of you can't be. And yet, every Sunday, there you are. I can almost see you, I can see you in my head. But we're glad that you've joined us today. Karen and I love you dearly. We're praying for you often. We pray that this message would bless you and encourage you and challenge you in loving your neighbors. God bless you.